Hello and welcome to the latest edition of The Truth Behind Dentistry. I'm your host, Darius Somagian. And today I have a special guest that really doesn't require much of an introduction. I've had the pleasure of knowing him for quite some time now, Dr. Travis Campbell. Welcome. Well, thank you, Darius. Pleasure to be here. It's an honor to have you. Many dentists know you out there. You're a very popular guy. You're a major KOL in my eyes. And you recently started the Dental Insurance Guy. Yes, I did. Basically an online training platform for understanding insurance and how offices can deal with it better, make it more profitable, things like that. Your understanding of the dental insurance space is on an extremely deep level, more so than I've seen from anybody else out there. What is it about dental insurances? I see all this banter on Facebook all the time about how practices have to go fee for service. The dental insurance is going to become the old antiquated way. Where do you see that all trending? It's always an interesting idea. I mean, I will say a few years ago, we still saw, and we've seen this trend of wanting to drop insurance forever. I mean, it's always been out there, but it's typically been fairly small. You see it once in a while, and there's not a lot of people that join bandwagon. In this last year, it's been a whole lot more popular topic. I mean, I almost see it every day, and more and more people are jumping on that bandwagon. But the reality of the situation is the reality, like many messages and many social platforms and online, is you're seeing the answers from those who are most vocal. Well, when you bring up the idea that, yes, let's drop network. All the people who have dropped network are going to go, yeah, absolutely get on board. All the people who have done it successfully. But you're going to have all the people who have done it unsuccessfully not want to talk about it because, you know, a lot of times we don't want to talk about our own failures. And then you've got a lot of people who don't feel that they can drop network. And there's a lot of reasons for or against that that aren't also going to speak up because it's almost seen as a stigma in some circles that, oh, you can't drop network. There's must be something wrong with you. And all it is is the math tells you the details. Over 95% of offices in the country are in network with somebody. Well, okay, that means 5% are on a network and fee for service. Okay, great. But that's not much larger of a number than it was two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. So currently, do I see a trend of that number increasing? Probably one, two, 3% maybe. Even if it doubles, you've got 10% of the market. Well, you've got 90% of the market that's still in network. And insurance companies are multi-billion dollar companies in some ways. I don't think they're going anywhere. The most likely, if anything happens to dental insurance as a total, is it gets absorbed by medical. That's about the only way I see dental insurance disappearing mm -hmm. in our lives. What's your take as far as the practice owner taking on one of those in-house membership plans, like plan rights, for example, and just managing it on their own? Why do they need a middleman insurance company in the mix? It all comes down to why somebody would sign up with insurance to begin with. It's all about marketing. It's all about getting patients in the door. So there are some offices that are successful fee-for-service. Great. They're usually pretty successful, either internal or external marketing. They're getting their own patients. But many dentists, our goal is to be clinical. Our goal is not we're not trained or we don't have a lot of motivation to run a business in many cases. And so that's not our wheelhouse. So when it comes to marketing, a lot of us put it out there to the insurance company to help us with. And right. that's just part of it. So you can either market heavy or you can go and network. But those things are almost, they're trying to accomplish the same goal. So if you're going to do one, Great. You don't need the other, but if you're going to try to drop one, you need the other. So we talked about how dental insurances are needed because the understanding from the practice owner's side is the more plans they're in, the more patients will find them on the directory and show mm -hmm. up, right? As right. far as new patients. Well, and that's where you get into those in-office plans like Plan Rise, for instance, is a lot of times it's offering the patients an alternative. Many patients view their insurance, no matter how good or bad it is, as a benefit that they own, that if you attack it, becomes a negative attack against them personally. That's just how they see it. Well, one way of doing it is saying, okay, here, great. The plan is good. This is what it's getting you. 
But how about let's look at an in-office membership plan and all the things you've spent and everything else. This actually gets you more value. So do you want to stay on your insurance that's giving you all these limitations? Or we have this alternative plan that still gives you a discount and network benefits and things like that, but it doesn't cost you as much or it gives you more. That's the thing is I love in-network membership plans because they give you that alternative. It's a lot harder to tell a patient, we're dropping your network. And by the way, we have no solution for you either. Well, patient's going to go like, well, that stinks. Versus if you say, well, we're not in network, but it's because our patients have really enjoyed this plan more and have seen more value out of it than the traditional insurance. Would you like to hear more about it? And then the patient's like, well, yeah, that sounds good. What? Are, tell me more. So membership plans are a great way to get patients off of insurance, but also a great way to attract those patients that don't have insurance. Is there a scientific approach to how a practice owner should sit down and analyze which insurances at whatever stage of their practice life cycle they're at that they need to keep or drop? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I probably have this conversation with people weekly. So part of it's looking at your overall schedule, you know, how, what's the office doing? If the office is fully booked out for months and you have a hard time getting new patients, well, that's telling you need to raise fees. And that's raising fees by just raising your cash fees or raising fees by dropping insurance networks because you can't handle the patients you have. And the only reason to be in network is to get more patients. So if you already have the patients you need, why are you still in network? That's one of the ways to look at it. But I have a lot of offices that are like, man, I'm just, it's not profitable and we can't make the money. We should drop network. Well, if they look at their P&Ls, their profit margin's low enough that when they drop networks, they will lose patients and lose collections. And now they lose a huge chunk of their profit. That's a challenge. So the first thing to look at for any office, in network, out of network, doesn't matter, but especially if they're looking at dropping networks, is to look at what ways can we be better, more efficient, more profitable current situation that we can fix today as opposed to the situation that is going to take months to fix and could be detrimental. And that's right. learning to build correctly. I mean, that alone can increase an office's collections by 10, 20, 30% doing the same exact industry. Learning to be more efficient, which means not moving faster, but being able to do procedures with less steps. So it ends up being quicker and taking less time, but each step you take is the same. And that can increase productivity 5, 10, 20% and decrease stress and burnout. Learning to be able to talk to patients better, learning to capture patients on the phone more. I mean, mm -hmm. most offices are losing half their patients on the phones that they shouldn't be losing purely because of how the phone's being answered. And so there's lots of steps an office can take that doesn't involve dropping networks, at least not yet, that can make them far more profitable now and prepare them for potentially dropping networks later when now they have a better cash flow, better budget, and a better ability to say, okay, if I lose that 20% income from X insurance company, I'll be fine because I know how to replace it later. What's your take on outsourcing billing to these RCM companies? It seems like in dentistry, there's just so many of them out there nowadays. If you add up the individuals doing it from home and the agencies that build a system around it. So outsourcing can be good or it can be bad. I mean, if you're outsourcing something that your team has very little involvement in, it's really easy. So for example, I mean, we've outsourced our new patient phone calls for years. It was a great company that does it, and we really don't have to have much involvement in it. So it's all based on how good the company is. And there are some that are great and some that aren't, but we've done it because then we can focus on the patients that are in the office and they'll answer the phone like 12 hours every day. Well, I don't want, none of my team wants to work 12 hours. So we have coverage for hours that patients are calling, but we're not there in the office. Outsourced billing can work or can be very problematic. The biggest issue I see with outsourced billing is a lot of people say, well, we want to outsource our billing because we're not very effective. Well, majority of the effectiveness of billing is the information that you're sending. Well, if you, the office and the provider in particular 
is not capturing correct information and enough documentation, you can outsource it all you want. The company's still going to have the same problems you did. So it's not going to solve the original issue. Now, I would say a majority of why outsourcing has probably become a much bigger topic in the last couple of years is the change in employment. People are, a lot of offices are having hard times getting enough people to work in the office. Well, if you can't get enough people to work in your office, outsourcing or virtual is a great way to supplement that. If you can't find enough people in the office and you don't have somebody who can answer the phones on a regular basis and within two or three rings, then yeah, outsourcing your new patient calls would be great because then you only have to deal with the existing patients and they will wait for a callback for a few hours. That new patient will wait five seconds. If you're having challenges, you don't have enough time with the billing process and everything else, as long as you learn how to adequately get documentation, then yeah, you can outsource to a billing company that will handle all that for you. But the way to think about any outsourced company is we're talking about running businesses and you always want to make sure your numbers are where they should be. So an outsourced company is part of your team, which means they're part of your payroll cost. So every office should be 25% or less on payroll cost per their collections. So if you outsource something that is a team member, when you look at your P&L, it should be under payroll costs. And therefore, the outsourced company should cost less than having somebody internal do it. And that's the big thing to look at. That's genius advice. From an economics perspective, when an office is sitting there analyzing what needs to be dropped and what needs to be kept, how does the practice owner go about understanding like the baseline of what that cutoff is? Is it by- You mean for like services? So yeah, for example, Code DXYZ is reimbursing 250 bucks for cleanings, but the office's daily cost to get that patient in the chair and process the cleaning from A through Z is $251. So they're losing a dollar and it's not worth it for them to keep that plant. Right. So in general, there are very few plans that don't pay enough if you're running things well and efficiently. Now, there are lots of plans that come close. But I would say a majority of the issue is many offices, and I coach offices, so I walk into this all the time, that are doing things the way they've always done them, but they're in a very inefficient manner. Not because they couldn't do it well, just because they haven't been trained to do it well, they don't know other ways to do it, things like that. So if you can, let's use a crown, for example. A dentist can spend an hour prepping a crown or 10 or 15 minutes prepping a crown. You're still going to get paid for the same either way. Well, you're going to make more money doing it quicker. Well, the thing to look at for the patient, the patient is either in the chair for an hour with just the prep, and now you've got all the other stuff to do, or in the chair for 15 minutes with all the other stuff to do. What's the patient prefer? If the outcome's the same either way, why would you spend more time doing it? And you can apply this to any task in the office, answering phones, dealing with billing, whatever it is. The more efficiently you do it, the less it's usually stressful on that team member, but the more productive they can be too. Yeah. And so we can talk about cleanings. A good example a couple of years ago is a lot of people ask for more time during their cleanings. Well, for what? I mean, you're not getting paid more. So can you find more time? Absolutely. There's lots of ways to be more efficient. I mean, for instance, we always use a hygiene assistant. She greatly speeds up our hygienist. Is she an extra payroll cost? Absolutely. But the extra productivity that comes from her being able to help the hygiene team be more productive more than makes up for it. And so we have that extra team member. How does the practice owner go about measuring the productivity of that decision to have that hygienist decision assistant there? Again, it's all math and numbers. So the number one thing is payroll. Payroll should be under 25% of your collections. And in most cases, it's not that team members are overpaid. It's often that they're not productive enough to compensate for that level of payment. And many of us, probably even in my office, and we've done every training and everything, we can probably get more efficient at a few things too. So there's always ways to improve. I would say my team is amazing and doing really well, but nobody's perfect. And so there's always ways to get better. And that's part of it is if you can increase your productivity just 10%, then usually 
if you're overpaying on payroll, increasing productivity will actually bring you back in line and be effective. When it comes to cost per procedure, that's often a big thing to look at too. Are you using supplies that are more expensive or that you can get from a cheaper location? Are you using more supplies than you generally need? Are you taking more time than you really need? Are you billing correctly for what you're really doing? And I had a conversation with an office earlier today. We were talking with the hygiene team and he's got a great hygiene team, but they were treating the patient well, but not billing adequately for the services they were providing. And therefore, they don't really have to change what they're doing. They just have to change what they're billing for. And more accurate billing means better compensation, which means that the value they bring to the office is actually higher. And they are seen as an even more beneficial part of the team. So a lot of it's, like I said, just improving productivity, improving your ability to help the patient. And something like that, you really can't track as a percentage of collections because if they're not billing the right amount, then the whole of the collections is not being factored in. Right. And that's where you have to look at it and go, I mean, to me, I just look at them and because I've seen them so many times, it's just a puzzle. But you look at a P&L and you look at the numbers and you go, okay, which numbers are wrong? Which numbers are off where they shouldn't be? You've got all your fixed costs. So your rent, your payroll, your utilities, if they're costing you more than the percentage they should be, you can't really change your fixed costs. You can't go to your landlord and go, I want to pay less rent. Mm -hmm. You have to increase productivity. That's the solution. But then you look at your variable costs, the things that cost you every time you do something. So your labs and your supply bills, if those are too high, then it means you may not be adequately billing for the services you're already doing, or it may mean you need to find alternative methods for those costs. Lab bill is probably the easiest one. I mean, I can get a crown for under $100. I can get a crown for over $500. I talked to an office two weeks ago. They're paying $1,500 lab fee for the crown. I, that blew my mind. I'm like, that's more than I charge for the crown, mm -hmm. period. And they say, yeah, they charge twice that for the crown. But I'm like, okay, if you want to pay that, that's fine. But you're not going to be able to provide a $500 or $1,500 crown on an in-network fee schedule. You just can't do it. And so you've got to find ways to do it, whether you charge upgrades or whether you get fully out of network or whether you find a different lab. And I'll even say this, I have not had great experience with over the seas labs, not that they're bad, but I just haven't found a good one for me. We pay less than a hundred dollars for most of our crowns and they're in a lab in the country. And I've been working with them five years now. Hey, I have some minor complaints, but I have minor complaints about every lab. So I get a case here and there that the contact's not as tight as it should be. Okay. Well. I can complain about that, but does that mean I want to switch lab? Not if it's a random occurrence. If it happens every time, I'm going to be complaining about it and they're going to be fixing it or I will find a new lab. But again, we're not paying top dollar, but we're still getting top results. Why would I spend $500 when I can spend a hundred? I just wouldn't. So interesting. I never thought that the accounting side of a practice, the P&L of a practice factors such a great approach and insight as to how you're going to manage the insurances for your practice. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. Because here's the challenge as humans, and I'm a very logical person, but I will admit we all make decisions based on emotion. It's what it is to be human. But when you're making decisions based on emotion, they're usually not as based in reality. I mean, we can, it's a good example, man, that patient just they owe money and we're having to send them to collections and blah, 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 blah. I just don't want to work with any patient with that insurance company. Okay, well, you have a thousand patients with that insurance company. That one patient is going to determine the entire outcome of everything. I get the emotional side of it, but we've got to step back and look at the logical. And the logical, I mean, the most logical thing ever is math. You can't, math is what it is. You can't look at it any different than just the numbers. And so it's a very easy way to look at, okay, here's the emotional decision. We want to do X. Well, now let's step back and look at the logical, look at the numbers and go, is X justified or can we get our solution through another way? And that's the beauty of math is, especially with a P and L, if you learn how to read it, 
it'll tell you everything you need about what you need to do with the office. It's amazing. Do most practice understand the PNL? My guess is no. I mean, I didn't when I first opened a practice. I, it took me a while to learn what to read and how to utilize it, what I need to do based on that information. And I'll even say personally, I don't look at my PNL every month. I probably should. I don't. But that is one way. If you want to grow a practice, it's look at your numbers on a regular basis, especially when you're trying to change things. Because if you look at your numbers and you go, okay, this is where we are now. Let me institute a change. Well, now you want to see how those changes are affecting your numbers. So maybe in three months, you want to look at it again and go, what's the difference? Is this change helped? Has it hurt? Or has it made no change, but it's made my life easier, so therefore it's good? So, I mean, again, it's the learning to use the math and numbers to actually help you guide what's the best result. Because I've seen all sorts, and I've made, I've made these mistakes myself all the time. I make them off emotion. I make them off knee jerk reactions. And then the solutions we put in place actually make things worse because we didn't actually look at the basics of was it truly a problem? I mean, one of the best lines I learned from my office manager, by the way, is if there's something that's happening that is a rarity, you don't want to change your entire system for how you treat every patient based off that 1% problem. Because now you can potentially affect your 99% of patients that are doing well. So we've always got to look at and go, is the problem big enough to make a systematic change for it or not? Interesting. Another good example, if you in-house finance a patient, let's say you finance $2,000, you place an implant, for instance, and for whatever reason, they default on that. Man, that stinks. You lost $2,000. That's a huge emotional hit. But do you look at that and go, Okay, we lost the $2,000. Let's not do any financing ever again in office. Well, look at the numbers. And if you look at and you finance $100,000 in patient treatment for all your other patients, and you only lost that $2,000, that's a 2% loss. You lose more money on your credit card than you lose on that. It, right. You lose more money on Care Credit or any other financing company than you lose on that. That's not a problem. But if instead you said, okay, we you know, financed out $10,000 and we lost $2,000, well, that's a 20% loss. Okay, now that's a bigger deal. Now you may want to look at your credit or a third-party financing. You may want to look at your process and how you're justifying who you lend money to is basically what you're doing. But again, it all comes down to the math. You can't just take that emotional jump and go, oh, we lost a case we don't want to finance anymore. I've heard it all the time. So that's the challenge. Invaluable insights. Thank you for all that. Switching up the topics to something even a little bit more related. Tell us about the dental insurance guy, your platform. So yeah, I didn't ever expect to be doing this. If you had asked me a decade ago whether I'd ever write a book, I'd tell you no, absolutely not. I'm not a writer, naturally. If you asked me if I'd ever get on stage and do public speaking, I'd say absolutely no. I'm an introvert. I am. And that seems weird. But when I go to conferences, if I'm kind of just like a guest at the conference, I'm usually in the corner watching people. And if people come up to me, I'm happy to talk to them. But I'm not the one that's going to just run around the room and talk to everyone. That's not my personality. I'm not that extrovert. But when I'm the speaker, people come talk to me. I don't have to spend that energy that drains me to go out and try to introduce myself to people. I uh, thought, gosh, this is so great. They're just gravitating towards me. I don't have to go and be outside of my shell. Yes. And it works really well for my introvert nature. But so I never thought I'd be doing any of this. It's not in my natural nature. But when I started a practice, we had a lot of challenges. I probably, I tell people I ran into every challenge possible. I probably created most of them. And so there's a lot of failures. So I had to learn to deal with them. And yet insurance is one that I mean, we're dealing with every day. It doesn't matter if we're in network, out of network, fully fee for service, our patients have insurance, we have to deal with it. And so it was a massive frustration for me as it is for a lot of people. And so I looked out and tried to find information. I really couldn't find much. I mean, found some good coding information, found some basics, but there wasn't anything in there about how to make it work and how to get covered and how to get paid and how to avoid denials. and 
all of the nuances of the insurance companies and how they work with us. And so I just started having to research it on my own, reading contracts and everything else. And then I started getting people asking questions and it just all evolved into, okay, well, let's put it online because I never had access to it early in my career. So I'm trying to give out that information that I never had so that other people can benefit from all the years of frustration, heartache, and things I had. Yeah, you know, I was surprised that the nominal cost involved to join your platform, what was it like $30 a month? Mm -hmm. Or 300 a year, which is even less. And they get access to messaging you and your team directly for any Q&A. Yep. I mean, this morning I answered eight, I think, just today. And I enjoyed it. It's fun. But it's also, I think, the biggest value of it. Yeah, there's CE courses and everything else, but it's that having a source to be able to ask the question that you're dealing with today. Ask about the claim that you're dealing with. I get a lot of claim questions. Well, we didn't get this crown paid. We didn't get this build-up paid. We didn't get this SRP paid. What's going on? Well, that's what it's there for, is to help. And I enjoy it. It's fun. That's what I like to do. I know I'm weird. I talk about insurance. I like insurance. I don't know. I'm weird. It is what it is. But it's super important for our office to get paid for what we do. And that's the biggest thing is we go to work to make money to take home for our families and support them. So when we're at work, we need to be productive so that we don't have to spend extra time at work. Early in my career, I hit a burnout stage. It was like four or five years out. But part of it was I was coming home and still working from home too. And so I never got that mental break that I think we all need. Well, nowadays, I don't work from home at all, at least not for the office. Once I leave the office, I stop thinking about the office unless there's a small little fire to put out, but I'm not doing it on a daily basis. I don't write notes from home. I don't do any of that. And so once I leave the office, I can release it. And I don't know about you, that helps me a ton. And that took me from a, I almost sold to corporate and just became a clinical dentist only to now I run two practices and I have fun and I enjoy it. And it's not draining. And I'm definitely nowhere near where I was several years ago with the burnout. You recently, in the past uh, several months, you wrote a book on dental insurances. Do you happen to have a copy of it with you? Yeah, because I was referencing it for an article earlier today, but I'm not saying dental insurance. insurance. Yeah. And this book, uh, how many copies have you sold to to date? Do you know roughly? They have printed 4,000 and most of them are sold. I mean, Amazon holds on to a few of them and then... I'm sure there's a few that are in shipping, but somewhere around there. I've had a lot of good feedback from it. It was a fun little project to do while I was cooped up in the office during COVID and I had nothing else to do productive. So, and I love my family, but I can't spend 24 seven with my kids. That's just not me. So I had to go into the office and I had to have something to keep me awake other than Netflix because I ran out of Netflix shows. So I read contracts and looked at dental language and laws and state laws and federal laws. And I put it all together and wrote the book. So just to be helpful. Amazing. Uh, quick story. I was at um, a trade show a few months ago. I think it was one of them in Florida. Mm-hmm. And I saw a vendor booth there. She just had books on the table. So mm-hmm. I like reading books. I went up to her. I said, um, tell me what your best selling book is. And I shit you not. She pulled out your book. <laughs> I wasn't surprised because I think you have a lot of intelligence to share with the dental community in a very insightful way. And by the way, the whole analogy you're making to being weird, I think you're only weird because you're the one of the only people I know that tackled this dental insurance topic so heavily. That's what set you apart as a weird person. Uh, I enjoy it. But yes, we've gotten lots of good feedback from the book from every aspect. I don't think I've heard a negative one yet. It'd be interesting the first time I do, just because I'd be curious why somebody doesn't like it. But again, it's all just understanding the process and being able to work it better. And the fun part is most of what I talk about actually helps everybody. It helps the patient, helps the office, and it makes it easier on the insurance company. They don't like dealing with denials either. So I would say almost as much as we don't like dealing with them. So I just show people how to avoid them. How can a practice owner out there listening to this reach out to you or an office manager? Best way is dentalinsuranceguy.com. The dentalinsuranceguy.com. No, the, just dentalinsuranceguy.com. 
dentalinsuranceguide.com. Perfect. And we've got CE courses, the Q&A things on there. There's forms to use, pretty much everything you could want. If there's something on there you, you want that's not there, message and ask, and we'll get up there as soon as I can. I think every practice owner should have a subscription with you. It's a no-brainer. Well, thank you. I agree. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time today. We really enjoyed uh, unpacking all this. It's been great chatting with you. My pleasure. Good talking to you, Darius. Yeah.